Welcome to Courageous Conversation with Teresa W. Gamble, a cultural storytelling, gracious space to bridge generational gaps through active listening and action-oriented changes. Greetings and welcome everyone. This is your hostess with the Moses, Teresa W. Gamble of Courageous Conversations coming to you again, again. We are celebrating, we are promoting International Women's Month, the whole month. Even though we know it's on March 8th, I am taking this privilege and opportunity to interview women across the nation that I have met through friends of mine from guests that's been on my show that has an amazing experience, backgrounds, and stories to share with you. So today, it's my favorite topic is learn life. It's talking about education because that is very important. We are never old to learn. But this particular conversation that um, we're going to have today with our guest, Ms. Lori Ann Bale, is about the polarization climate, political climate in the educational public school system. And she's a recent graduate with her doctoral degree. Woo-hoo! I am so excited for you for that. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Bell. Thank you so much, Ms. Gamble. Thank you for the invitation to talk with you and your listeners. I'm that excited. Is- Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Bell is located in Michigan. I am in Florida. So we're going to do some comparing and some contrasting of the different laws, legislations, and political polarization that's going on in our public education systems from an educator's lens. We've heard enough on the news from the politicians, the legislators, from the departments of education from the states, from even from our governors and some of our local government um, entities and city councilmen, commissioners, and aldermen. But no one is talking to the educators, the ones who are impacted the most by all these constant changes. So Dr. Bell, tell me how um, public education legislation has changed for you in Michigan at this point. Wait, before you do that, wait. Okay. Let's. Okay. Who is Dr. Lori Ann Bell? Let's talk about <laughs> you first. Let me back up. I'm so excited. I'm ready to get into this episode. <laughs> Let's back up. Let's back up. I get it. Okay. Who is so, Dr. Lori Ann Bell? Dr. Lori Ann Bell defended her dissertation on September 27th and had her degree conferred at graduation on December 18th of 2021. I have a doctorate uh, in education with an emphasis on educational leadership. Wow. Um, I received that from the University of Michigan Dearborn. Very proud graduate of that campus. I did my master's work there as well. Right now, my current position is literacy and social studies supervisor uh, for a school district just about 30 minutes north of Detroit in Southeastern Michigan. That means I'm responsible for all things teaching and learning as relates to literacy and social studies. Prior to this uh, position, I was just about 25 years in the Detroit Public Schools District as a classroom teacher, Title I teacher, and instructional coach before transitioning to my current role. So I've had uh, been a few places and seen a few things as it relates to um, education. Looking forward to continuing my research uh, with educational leadership and can really want to dig deeply into African-American females and administration at the building level and at the central office level. So that's a little bit about me. Wow. I love it. I love it because guess what? That's my concentration too. And leadership. <laughs> I'm getting my doctorate, but I've been kind of keeping it quiet. But everyone that's listening now, you're hearing it first. That's so your best. girl is working on hers. And hopefully um, I will be doing the same, but I'm going to deal more with the trauma side of education and social and emotional learning because of the delay with some of the students um, because of the pandemic, especially our children of color, you know, being behind, not having adequate access to internet capacity to learn online, parents not available to be there to help them navigate. So that is cool. Thank you, Dr. Bell. And I appreciate what you want to do and focus on for African-American women in leadership and air leadership. So from that let's move into this polarization climate in public education and it's picked it's picked up a lot of speed i feel after the george floyd murder 
from the mm-hmm. social unrest. I think mm-hmm. everything came full, bubbled up to the top, so to speak. The volcano erupted where we were having a lot of conversations and so many people was at awe and at shocked. And to me, I have a lot of allies. They all are uh, individuals in general from outside our race always ask the question, well, I don't understand. I don't get it. And a lot of African-Americans are tired of explaining the story. True. So from that perspective, what has been your experience and how is it impacting public education there in Detroit? So at this point, the impact, the impact is, is strong. It has adjusted curriculum to the point where, point where it's adjusted conversations, where teachers are having to say, especially during the height of all the violence and the protest and the unrest, had to stop and pause and have those conversations with students. I was a little surprised, not, well, I won't say surprised, unpleasantly surprised when you spoke about the topics that are not up for discussion as relates to schools in the state of Florida, racism, LGBTQ, um, being rigid with curriculum, which for me as a curriculum person, I might like that part, but (laughs) black and brown authors taken out of libraries, it is the opposite here. Our district was just awarded the Michigan Comprehensive Literacy uh, Development Grant. And a part of that grant is we have to show that we are including diverse texts for our students. We've had a lot of training here in Michigan at the state level, at the intermediate school district or county level about the need for our children to have mirrors and windows and sliding doors. They need to see themselves in the literature, absolutely, but they need to be able to see other cultures as well and be able to enter in and support that. So when I'm looking for a text, I've just adopted two new literacy, no, uh, social studies, yes, and two new literacy texts. That is part of how we select our text in our district. It has to be culturally relevant. There have to be opportunities for our students of color to see themselves. My district is about, I'm going to guess here, maybe 80% African-American, Um, No, maybe more like 70 because we have a good 24% English learners and many of them are Spanish speaking at all. So we have to be diverse. We have to support all of our children. Um, And also of course, being in charge of social studies as we're looking for those resources for K-5, I have been known to say, you know, we're not coloring pictures of Christopher Columbus, okay? So we're gonna make sure that the children have the authentic history that is American history. We're not espousing any particular theories of that, but we are doing what we can to make these situations as diverse as possible. And no, it's not easy. And that doesn't mean that every page is gonna have a black or brown child, but we believe the children need to know about all cultures. You need to know about Hindi children. You need to know about uh, indigenous peoples, especially here in Michigan, we have such a large indigenous population. So yes, that has been where our work has been concentrated over the last couple of years. Wow, that is amazing. I would love that. But yeah, as I was mentioning before I interview you, several legislation laws, I mean, really have been bulldozed through and the Democrats, you know, have been trying to slow it down or to stop it. You know, many citizens have came to speak to the legislators before these laws were passed. And it's like, it fell on deaf ears. I mean, you actually have a Stop Woke Act. That stop woke at stop woke w o k e at so stop okay so they want everybody that's the racism it it, you're right that's the racism um act for individual freedoms to be able to express and they want to seek full censorship of I mean to seek censorship of full honest discussions about American history so they don't want educators talking about the um, history of America really targeting the 1619 project Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. other um, situations that came up with George Floyd and all the other um, Amai Aubrey uh, in the neck of our woods, um, Breonna Taylor. They don't want us having those conversations in the classroom, but 
they're not looking at the fact that these children live in neighborhoods that's riddled with this high crime and it's a possibility a stray bullet or a um a no not warrant may experience occur near them or to them as they self so there is no place for them to talk about it and now with the don't say gay bill that's where you cannot talk about anything about lgbtq whether the students not giving them support and in a recent white paper i just wrote i spout the contradictions with the florida state laws they just passed to the federal laws for the department of education it's a contradiction. And to me, my question has been, you know, how are you going to deal with that when those parents know that right exists for their children and they go above the state? What will happen? Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to share that with you, because all this stuff, you know, literally everyone in the country is looking at the state of Florida to be able to accelerate these laws so I love the fact that the teachers in Detroit they took the time and like you said had those teachable moments about the issues with the social unrest in George Floyd and you as a curriculum facilitator and I love y'all have the diversity grant where you have to include but how, what advice would you address to the teachers in Florida and other states that's institute in legislation like this? How do they need to deal with it? What mm. advice could you give them? That's um, a very loaded question. I know people, it is. People, people need to be able to stay indoors and keep their jobs. Well, true. Um, there's a lot of different resources for teaching. There's a lot of different literature. And that would probably take a concentrated effort, perhaps in the grade level PLC or, you know, school districts are large mm -hmm. and unwieldy. And even one as small as mine, the district I currently work in, we only have 11 schools and coming from Detroit, I thought that was small, not necessarily. There's a lot more autonomy than one might think. So just because these interesting laws have been passed does not mean that they will necessarily be enacted uh, one thing that one of my county consultants was saying that they're working on at the county level is um, a book challenge policy for each district to adopt so that if a parent comes forth and wants to challenge a certain text, there will be a list of indicators that they have to address. And then we as the district would have a list of indicators or, or rationale, part of a rationale for why we selected that text. And so that might be what that Florida educator um, may have to do. It's, it's pretty much the antithesis of what I've been teaching for the last 10 years, but she might have to go in her room, close her door and teach. Um, or she might have to collaborate with a like-minded um, teacher and just see what she can come up with. And just to introduce the children. And again, all books, and that's again, something that we try to work towards is having more books of African-American authors with every book with African-American or I'll just say black and brown children is not written by an African-American person. Right. So there is plenty of literature out there written by people of other races that includes black and brown children. So that might have to be the workaround if you truly want your children. And it might be something just that simple for a first or second grade teacher for a read aloud all the way up to the policy pieces I was speaking of for perhaps the principal or the district leaders. Well, that that might be the one little tiny work on G. What books with black and brown children in them were not written by black and brown people because they do exist. So that might be something that they could think about. I love that work around. I really do. I love it because I, I mean, my heart went out to them being in the classroom and you're trying to be creative and keep the students engaged mm -hmm. at the same time, trying to keep make sure they're a, a reaching student achievement. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. with the polar um polarization of the political politicalization of public education is it stronger in Detroit? Has it died down, or you're waiting for the next to come? Yeah, because we you know um, Michigan is not the most diverse state. We have pockets of persons of color. We have a strong, strong Republican uh, presence, I'll call it here. So I'm not surprised often, or I should say I won't be surprised to hear what may come down um, from Lansing. You know, we currently do have a Democratic mayor, female, mm -hmm. and she catches, it's called an awful lot of flack 
for right. many of the things that she has done. So at this point, um, I'm going to say we're not feeling it as directly, at least not here in Southeastern Michigan. Um, I don't know, I was, I was just reading about these parent groups mm -hmm. or mom groups where their entire purpose is to challenge literature. Yeah. And so since my school district is situated in poverty, but it's also inside of one of the richest counties in the state as well as in the country, I'm sure there's some of those little groups around the county. And I'm going to take a look around and just so for my own personal awareness to see um, a lot of times those things grow quietly. And then you look up and they're there. So I'm glad that it's been brought to light so that we can be aware um, and prepared for what may or may not come forward. That's good. You are exactly right. You know, they do a lot of stuff um, in private, kind of remind me of the women's mm -hmm. suffrage movement, but the women did a lot of stuff underground, quiet, and all of a mm -hmm. sudden they just mm -hmm. um, revealed themselves out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Not yeah, to get, sure. exactly, not to get more technical because I noticed um, there's an organization in Florida, it's called Equality Florida, and they have really been against a lot of this legislation in Florida, and mm -hmm. they have two campaign videos they've put out about the Don't Say, um, the um, Stop Woke Act and the Don't Say Gay Bill, and in both of those videos, they use a Black educator, and a lot of times, Black educators, be it the gender, male or female, are often more so targeted. And we get the brunt of everything or we get the harshest reprimand of everything. Mm -hmm. Is that type of level of, do you notice a difference of educator reprimand or read of anything of educators reprimand disparities in Michigan? Because I know what's going on in Florida. A lot of it just doesn't get. Pub, um, become public knowledge. And I would say that I don't know that I've seen any specific data to speak to um, misrep misrepresentation or Im unbalance as it relates to educator evaluations. Um, but I cannot sit here and say, oh, no, that doesn't happen. Right. So I would have to I would have to look at some data. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and which is understandable. But the thing I have found, even because I've taught in public school and I taught in private school, which the mm -hmm. climate is much different. And mm -hmm. I noticed Georgia is trying to pass a similar legislation in Florida, but they're going at the private schools, not Georgia public schools. Mm -hmm. So are there any um, public schools in Detroit and are they experiencing this? Um, are they aligned with the district? there in Detroit or they are a complete independent entity on their own? You're or speaking of the, the private schools? Right. Um, now that's one thing that I did not learn until I um, began in this role. We share a lot of the same funding mm -hmm. and a lot of the federal funding that we receive, we have to have to portion a part of it to um, the private schools, but they are largely private. They get to write their own curriculum and for the most part, do what they want to do. We still have just two or three of the schools run by the Archdiocese, um, the Catholic schools, not as many. When I was growing up, we had several. Of course, you know, they went through a lot of, a lot of closure. And again, I told you I live in an affluent county. Right. So there are a couple of um, residential programs, um, exclusive private schools in the county. Uh, I don't know because I don't know a lot of African-American educators that work there. So gotcha. that would be look, another piece of research, some interesting data to take a look at, um, to see about these educators of color who work in the private, and that's the thing, Michigan, if it's, it's more than likely an affluent school. Again, when I was a little girl, it was all kind of low Catholic schools and working parents could put together their tubes and pieces in their children, but now that's not the case. They're all going to be it's very pricey, like akin to college tuition. The private schools are now and very private and not necessarily based on, on any sort of religious organization. So wow. that might be something to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I totally agree. So tell me what is a typical day in the life of an educator um, for you <laughs> um, when you was in the classroom compared to what educators are dealing with today? 
So you're asking about the difference between when I was in the classroom and whatever year that was, <laughs> 2000, 2009, 10, whatever, to wow. what I see when I go and visit schools now. Yes. Let's see. Probably on, on a lot of levels, uh, Ms. Teresa, kids are kids. Right. Um, they will still oftentimes, right now I'm thinking about elementary because that was my family, but that's where I, I live. They will, for the most part, respond to the mama look, to the calm voice of reason, to the direction. It's funny, when we're in there, usually if I'm in the school now, I'm either attending an event or I'm going to see instruction. So if I'm going to see instruction, I'm in and out 15 minutes with my notes and I'm, and I'm moving. Mm -hmm. But teacher is, as teacher does always, if somebody's acting nutty, you probably are going to stop and say something for the most part. But what I do see that is probably more prevalent a big learning curve for me was secondary. I spent very little time in middle school and no time in high school. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the language issues, um, the meaning the inappropriate language. But to me, I think the amount of mental illness is quite frankly increasing. Uh, when I was taking my special ed course during my doctorate, I said, well, if you all started making up you know, classifications, learning about this new one and learning about that new one. And of course, being situated in poverty, we cannot pay as well as we might want to. And so we've had a hard time recruiting good quality help to support those students, good quality training. So because there's always going to be children who are not identified. And then there are children who aren't special needs who just need a different strategy. So then there, there's always that as well. But maybe that might be one of the biggest differences is the increase in actual diagnosable mental illness. It seems like in communities in general, um, but aside from that caveat, children are children. They still want, they want structure. They want guy. they want to be engaged as you were speaking earlier in the instruction that's going to keep them from behaving. Um, of course, there's tons more of technology. All we had was maybe an overhead a smart board was a new and exciting thing. Now it's an expectation. Of course, after coming off of what we came from with our year and a half of virtual, you know, teachers rose to the occasion, did amazing things sitting on a camera like you and I. With, I mean, I saw them decorate their homes and put up boards in the back, uh, do whatever it's taking. We have still had to do that to an extent a little bit this year. So, you know, the toys and the bells and the whistles, some of those things are different that issue but we still children still need to learn they still need to follow the standards again they still need to get up walk and talk while they're learning they still need to know how to read write listen speak and think um yeah so th those things have not changed i did not have common core state standards to support my lesson planning i wish that i had um you know so some some things are improvements some things stay the same but that's Education is largely cyclical. Right. It is, but good, solid instruction really doesn't change. It can improve. It can expand. Again, it may get to be virtual. We may have to sometimes, that's what I was going to say, um, deal with our own biases, even as educators of color. Right. My, my favorite example of my own bias is I'm 55 years old. I want your pants up on your behind. But that's me. That's, that has nothing to do with your intelligence, with your capability, with you being a good kid or a quote unquote bad kid. That's my bias. That's what I think is important. So I have to recognize that and toss it. Mm -hmm. But if we don't know what they are and we don't recognize them, then we won't. And even as educators of color, we may not be giving our children of color what they need if we're not attending to our biases. So yeah, it, it changes. It's more... Sometimes you think things are more intense now. You know, I'm sure there is more violence and, and oh my God, more drugs. Yeah, because we didn't have edibles and vaping. Exactly. Really too, too many opportunities now, um, things to consider, but building relationships, getting to know kids, creating a culture, attending to your environment and your organization. Those are, those are things that don't change. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. And something that you said that stood out to me about the mental health issues mm -hmm. with a lot of the increase on school shootings. 
Do you feel from your perspective and your expertise that a lot of the mental health issues eventually leads to a student becoming an active shooter or is it something prior and what could educators do now with all what we've gone through with with this pandemic and dealing with this political polarization to kind of be more cognizant even though educators wear already wear so many hats as it is Mm -hmm. to be able not to have a a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas a Parkland shooting or the recent shooting I think that was near you how Mm -hmm. what what best practices or from your perspective to address those students who take that step to become an active shooter that want to cause physical harm to others. So as you just mentioned, we did have an instance here Mm -hmm. in my county um, and it was in an affluent district and not the place where you would say, oh gee, that happens here. So that's the first thing. You never make any assumptions about what will or will not happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of, everyone has an opinion. This staff member should have seen this, that staff member should have seen that we don't know we weren't there. Right. But what we know that we have to do is one, not make any assumptions, none ever Two, attend to everything. It's you talked about the roles of a teacher and eyes, you know, old people say when we were kids, eyes in the back of your head, that, and then some, because a careless comment, you know, up. you know, um, a careless comment, repeated behavior, may or may not, you don't know. Usually I would say from my experience, those situations don't just appear. Oftentimes there may have been other behaviors. Again, we don't know. Right. But that's why back to that, um, that collaborative piece and talking with one another about our children and not um, in a negative way, but just the facts. I saw this, Jim Bob did that. I was wondering, did he do this in your class? This morning we were having this discussion and that came out, talking to one another and being very, very aware. There's so much here, you talk about what's different. We also didn't have all of the stimuli from the internet, et cetera. So we know that these kids can get a hold of any and everything, how to, you know, whatever with the gun any type of any type of weapon or any type of violence they can see on their phones right so that just causes us to have to be that much more aware we all have to pay very close attention in some districts you may be blessed to have that personnel um those sociologists and those psychologists i mean social workers excuse me and psychologists who can actually see students and can be able to provide some support but a big part of that also, so you've got to be aware, you've got to not make any assumptions, you have to lean on your colleagues and be aware as a team, but you also have to have your parents as part of your team. So if you don't have that uh, rapport developed, that relationship, then they're not going to accept the help that you have to give them. And in K-12, you can't help the children without the parents' uh, consent. So that has to be part of that relationship as well. They have to trust you enough to believe that you want to help and accept the help. And we see that in this district, we see, you know, there was, there's always been a piece of paper. And I remember running parents down, mom, we got to talk, mom, I need you to sign this. I've seen these behaviors, we put this behavior plan together. That's always been the case. But again, so I think that yes, some of that increased Mental illness could be part of the contributing factors, but there that's just the fact. There are so very many contributing factors. There are dozens. So yeah. Wow, that's good to know. Uh, Cause I'm 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 like you. Um I had my questions too and um you know, this discussion with my husband and I told him, I say, we wasn't there. We don't know what the logistical or the moving factors was. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, with them having a conversation with the parent. And I'm a big proponent of getting the parents involved with their child's learning, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to behavior issues. You know, I would, you know, let the parents know, okay, I cannot allow your son or your daughter to disrupt the whole learning environment. This is where I need us to partners to address these issues and to find out what's going on. If I see something, I will say something to you and I will appreciate vice versa. You tell me, for instance, it could be a death in the family. Something may have happened outside of school that's going to be triggering these behaviors. So, which a great segue, since you say you go and do classroom observations, Mm -hmm. what are some overview do's and don'ts would you like to share with educators that's listening, that's currently, that's seasoned, that's new or even inspiring, thinking about getting into the education industry? Do's and don'ts. Um, how about some must-haves? That's must true. Have, must-have relationship. Yes. You have to get to know the children. Yes, I still call them children. Yes. Um, you must have routines and procedures kids have to know when they hit the door this is what this is what we do mm-hmm. i can remember my principal saying to me a thousand years ago well they know they came in and pulled their little journals out yep because they know that's what they do when they hit the door um there has to be work again everything's about when they hit the door because you're setting the tone right then you know the greeting at the door i've seen some of the cutest little uh of the videos across facebook with all the young energetic teachers doing all the high fives and the dancing and greeting the kids when they come in. If that's you, do that, whatever it takes. But there must be a routine for when they come in, routine for when they sit down. This is how we come to the carpet if you're with little people. This is how we switch subjects. This is what I do when I need help. These are the behavior expectations. And they have to be constantly reviewed. Because one thing, if, if the routines and the procedures aren't there, then there will be, as I would say, tohu and bohu, and no one will learn anything. Um, Our children have a lot of different levels. You can't address all the different levels in your room without doing some small group and some differentiation. Well, you can't do that unless you've taught them how to be in the group. So they have to know if I'm working with these three, you ask your neighbor, your voice is at this level. It's all about, that's why uh, no one understands fatigue like teacher fatigue. No one has been tired until they've stood in front of children for six hours because it takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot of planning before you walk in. I guess maybe that might be my next thing is you have to plan. Yes. And I know it's up to people like me to try to support you with the structure for that. But any good teacher will tell you she's not, she don't care if she gets 50 minutes every day. That's not when the majority of her planning is done. It's still done before or after school. Um, when I was a very young substitute, I had a kindergarten teacher who would say, I stay here until five o'clock because when I go home, that's my son's time. Whatever, however it is, you have to work it out because you can't go in and shoot from the hip. And as the curriculum and the content supervisor, I don't care how many great resources I give you and how many digital and hard copy TEs, if you don't open them and do what they say. Um, so what did I say? I said routines and procedures. I said relationship. I said planning. Um, and this is my own little personal thing. Stick to the plan before you veer off. Um, no one is saying to you that you aren't intelligent and no one is saying to you that you are not uh, a professional. But if I give you a resource, it's because I believe it's evidence-based, that it has strategies built in, And if you're following that resource, then you'll use the strategies, like we talked about the engagement and the movement and the conversation. Oftentimes, you know, the way these, it's almost overwhelming all of the information that's put into the textbooks these days. The vendors, they know what we want now and they're just giving us a thousand different choices. Mm -hmm. Do that. Then after we together as a group figure that out, then we can get creative. But sometimes you might see, you, you may have some inconsistency because someone's veering off from the group. Again, not that you have to be a robot. Well, let's try to follow, let's try to do what's Um, evidence-based and collaborate. That'll be my last one. We, none of us learn, the children don't learn well in isolation and neither do the adults. Iron sharpens iron. 
We have to lean on one another. We have to get it grade level content. Talk about our data. What, what's happening in the room? What are our kids doing? What aren't they doing? How can we support one another? Everybody's kid is having an issue with um, plural spellings for babies or with cause and effect for biggins. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to address cause and effect. Let's go and use this strategy, come back and talk about it, pull out some student work and figure out what's going to happen. And again, it's up to people like me to make sure you got a structure that there's a period or we're going to pay you. Either there's a period in your day or I got some dollars to pay you to do that. But yes, that's called a best practice. And those are things that I did as a teacher, unfortunately, back in the olden days, whether I got paid for it or not. But it was what needed to happen and what needs to be done. But those are just some of the basics. And, and I love your point. You will see some of those things happening or not happening with novice or veteran teachers. There's a whole lot of reasons why. You will have, so we call our substitutes guest teachers. You will see some of those things happening or not happening with the guest teachers. It all, it all depends. Um, it's to the person. And I, I don't know, I'm, one of my goals is to begin to teach at the post-secondary level because I'm determined. These young people, we need to really understand what they're walking into. And right. that there's nothing easy about it. You, you may think that work day is six hours. Not really. It's really eight. And that 10-month thing, yeah, that's pretty much a thing of the past as well. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to somebody's training or getting ready for the year. You're doing something in the summer. I can't think of the last time I actually had a full summer. That's a fallacy. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard work. It is. You are in front of 30 people of variable sizes, depending on your level, all day. You got to work next to another 30. You got to report up, report down. It's, it's a lot. And then we've got all the things we've been discussing today, all the legislation pieces, all of the, the this and that and the other. And again, whatever craziness that you think someone at my level is giving you, you've got, it's a lot to contend with. So yeah, they need to have that full understanding before they walk into the classroom. And I think that's part of the problem with some of the exodus that we're having. It's not everyone has a full understanding of what they're truly walking into. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart. No, it is not. No, not exactly. I can amen. I can amen. <laughs> and I can amen. Not that I, you know, don't miss teaching. I do. But, mm -hmm. um, and I teach in different genres. It was public education, cosmetology, even workforce education. Mm -hmm. It takes just as much as effort and work that it does in K-12 or um, traditional college. But mm -hmm. I love how you spoke to the different levels of the educators and even addressing our biases. Because I too, I'm the type all about, you know, pulling your pants up, being a cosmetologist, we work on appearance. And mm -hmm. my message and my motto a lot of times to my students, people see you first before they hear you. Mm -hmm. And from that observation and perspective, they make a decision whether they want to engage with you or have a conversation with you. So I you know, I truly believe, you know, setting the precedence and the standard from the time they walk in the door. I remember when I started our substitute teaching, I actually would put a sign on the door. Please don't come out in class with our book, your books, your paper, and something to write with. Because those are your tools that you're going to need to work today. And I used to mentor new teachers in the public school. Every day after school, they would come in my classroom and we would talk about their day. We'll talk about what went right, what went wrong, you know, how to manage the classroom, how to juggle so many things, because mm -hmm. they couldn't figure out how I would get my students to do my homework. And I told them, I said, you have to have a strategy to have that classroom instruction, that time for them to do the work in the class to see if they grasp in what you're doing. And then if you have extra time before they switch classes, because I taught secondary, mm -hmm. I would encourage them, okay, this is not the time to social. This is the time you need to start on your homework. So if you got mm -hmm. questions for me, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would be the time to ask. Mm -hmm. So I love the advice and the instruction that you provided and even with the active shooter training how we got to be more aware even though mm -hmm. educators wear so many hats and maybe that's the reason and this just is Teresa's perspective okay. why the governor of Florida 
at the beginning of the pandemic um, enormously increased teacher salaries and pay before all this legislation came down. Really? Yes. I mean, he inflated it. It's the highest I ever seen it, even oh when I was teaching. So, and I feel like because of that monetization of t- increasing teacher salary, because the Florida zone was the lowest in the nation, like toward the bottom. Okay. So, what I'm saying back then when I was teaching, you know, it was like capped at 30,000. 30, now they're increased mm-hmm. it to almost like 45, between 55K a year for the mm-hmm. teachers here in Florida. Okay. But at the end of the day, it's still not enough for yeah. what they're yeah. trying to do and implement with this new legislation policies. No, not at all. So one thing I want to um, deviate to before we finish this amazing interview is the parent parent relationship. And the reason I'm bringing this up, because there is a one of the legislative laws that was passed mm-hmm. that impact the education institutions in florida with this Mm covid-19 some schools are still having enormous outbreaks of covid cases between staff and students especially in florida and in the in the county i live in so much so that the district stopped putting the covid dashboard on the home page you have to dig for it now wow And then when I did my recent white paper and I realized almost 1,700 staff members contracted COVID and almost 8,000 students between K through 12 contracted COVID. And most of the numbers was in our urban core rural communities where our black and brown and poor white students live. In this one of these legislations, which is called um, the Florida Jobs Act, the public schools in Florida cannot make students report their COVID-19 vaccination status. They cannot force students to wear masks. They cannot um, isolate healthy students from COVID-19. If any school district in Florida do, parents have the right to sue the school district and recruit attorney fees as well okay i missed that last you said parents have the right to sue and then what else came after that sue the school district for invoking invoking those practices and collect their attorney fees in the suit yes Mm ma'am so my concern is and this is an approach that i put in the white paper how is the school district in your area addressing the COVID-19 protocols because I just heard on the national news a couple of days ago uh, there's another variant out. Mm-hmm. That's correct. I heard that B B A two or something to that effect. Um, our county mm-hmm. is supposedly lifting the mask ban sometime this month. Okay. Our district is not. Okay. Um, our District has and provides masks. Mm -hmm. We have air purifiers. We have desk shields for teachers and students. In the administrative building, in all buildings, you check in. The temp check in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, In our administrative building, we check in, and we are. We if I leave my, I'm right now in my office with the door closed. If I leave my office, I put my mask on. Um, We determine. We gather very little. Still, kind of having some small admin built admin meetings uh, may go out off site and have those. If we do, we kind of determine who we're sitting next to because we talk conversationally about our vaccine status, whatever have you. But as far as um, what's being enforced, students and teachers are still wearing masks. Our cases seem as though, you know, you can never quite tell, look like they may be becoming a little more manageable. Mm-hmm. But we have still have protocols in place for children who get sick in school and there are certain areas for them. Those things are still in place. We are following the Michigan Department and the, and the County Department of Health and whatever they say, which comes down from the CDC. So whatever right. they say is how we're, you know, um, even if you would, would they change from six feet to three feet, you know, whether you agree with it or not. But 
whatever is coming down uh, from policy, that's what we're following. So there's not been, to my knowledge, and again, someone could be working quietly to be crazy, but to my knowledge, there's not been anything that says you have to or you can't. So right. at this point, we're still doing that. There are some districts that are still testing students and teachers. So, you know, everyone's pretty much following, you know, following, following the state and the county guidelines where they work. That's that's great to know because mm-hmm. between our, right between mm-hmm. but see the new um, Florida um, surgeon health doctor does not believe in vaccination does not believe in masks and has even issued individual business owners that we cannot force people to provide proof of vaccination or to make them to wear masks or even businesses would be fine. So that's that's the climate of Florida. And to our, my listeners and my viewers, this is why I want to have this conversation so you can see the different, differentiation between the states of what's going on to protect our children. Now, this is Teresa thinking. This ain't nobody thinking. This is my thinking. If your teachers, your paraprofessionals, your staff, and even your school officials, if they get sick and contract COVID, how will your students learn if they do not follow the CDC guidelines? And then the district has to um, be concerned with the threat of a lawsuit by a parent. So I brought that up, um, Dr. Bell, to say the importance of building that parental relationship with the educator. What advice for from veterans, inspiring, emerging educators, how important it is to take time to build that relationship with the parent. It's extremely important. Um, Even, I guess I've learned a lot in this role, you know, attending some trainings, some meetings, doing a little bit more reading. And one researcher that I really admire, she says, we need to ask the parents, what would they like to teach us? What do they have to offer? What do they think about what we're doing and what we're teaching? I mean, you know, again, in the olden days, you, the basics, you greet them warmly, you reach out, and hopefully not just when there's something wrong. Um, I taught at a community, a neighborhood school for nine years. It was wonderful. I would have, you know, all three or four kids in the family and that sort of a deal. And we developed, for the most part, a great rapport. But still, did we probably utilize that support to the fullest? No because there are probably areas where parents could have supported us that we, and we didn't know because we didn't ask. So, and it's even to me, even more important now, more important when you're trying to manage a pandemic, uh, especially it was important when we're trying to help people um, educate their children at home, or I should say at least supporting their children of trying to be educated um, at home, being able to call and say, hey mom, you know, Jim didn't log in or, He's logged in, but I see him in there playing with the dog and somebody go get the dog out because I've seen that. The things that we saw during our virtual season, uh, the distractions in that. Um, yeah, having that rapport helps that. But, you know, it's also good to just have that rapport to enjoy. It doesn't have to be to manage a crisis. It can be just to build a great relationship and have a great community school. Uh, one of our principals does a great job with that because she's been in one reason who she is, but another is because she's been in the district so long, she's taught a lot of her parents. But that going that step further is what helps make your school a strong community. And so then that supports what's gonna happen in the classroom to help that, you know, to make that community in the classroom stronger. So yes, absolutely, it needs to be a priority in the building, but you need to make that effort with your parents. Again, greet them, get to know them, reach out, invite them in. And again, don't let it just be because so and so got put in the corner today or whatever. Yeah, no. I love that. I <laughs> love that. I um now for me before I got in the classroom, I was the parent teacher association president. Mm. So before I got in the classroom, I had already built a lot of rapport with a lot of the high school parents, mm-hmm. and I made sure as the PTA president, I stayed neutral. I wasn't for school. I wasn't for parents. I was like mm-hmm. that mediator. And I brought both sides to the table. I'm like, this is what the parents are concerned about. 
And this is what the school need from you. So what I did to bring the two groups together Mm -hmm. when I started in the classroom was when we had standardized testing, I asked all the parents in the PTA, could they sponsor breakfast to make sure all the children got to eat breakfast so parents didn't have Mm -hmm. to stop, pick up breakfast that week we were testing so everybody can be on time. The teachers can have that opportunity to get their children settled and situated, give them those directives like you talked about earlier on what the expectation is during testing. Mm -hmm. And one of the parents went and got a local McDonald's to sponsor breakfast for the entire K-12 through school. Wow. And they came and served every Ooh. classroom. The parents did it. And okay. my principal looked at me. She said, How in the world? I said, I didn't do nothing. I just made the ass. <laughs> I said, You opened the door. Right. I said, <laughs> I made the ass. And they worked out the logistics. And my parents, they had different backgrounds some was in corporate america some was self-employed some was retired some was grandparents and with them being on campus and we got them the carts and they went and they delivered the breakfasts they got to get to know the other teachers on campus besides me they got to see their classrooms and then when we had lunchtime they you know they got through eating breakfast they cleaned up the parents cleaned up Mm. left when we break for lunch guess what they came back with lunch for the kids so the staff who was helping with the testing would get a chance to get a break the teachers was able to get a break and they would take them outside and supervise them to give them that PE time so I agree with you building that relationship with them parents matter because even though I switched to a teacher role guess what the Mm principal did she left me as the parent teacher association president because I had already <laughs> I had that rapport with them. It, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. <laughs> so I okay. mentioned that as an example of how you can volunteer, mm-hmm. get involved, and you do it so well till the school hires you and mm-hmm. still keep that rapport and then get them to get involved. They had a voice. They, you know, we did fundraisers. I remember one month, Dr. Bell, um, we had a contest. It was selling cookie dough. The school, we needed some stuff for the school. Mm-hmm. And I had a contest where the, by grade level, elementary, middle school, high school, whatever student mm-hmm. sold the most cookie dough, they get to go to lunch in a limo during school hours oh, with their goodness. teacher and me. Mm-hmm. I did not think that incentive was going to drop in one month, Dr. Bell, we sold $20,000 worth of cookie dough. Oh my goodness. So, exactly. (laughs) So when, that's why I wanted to bring up relationship on the positive Mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And when each student that won at each grade level, guess what I did as an extended invitation? I invited the parents to go that day. So they get, they met us at the school. We had this big old long stretch limo. So it was me, each of the students from elementary, middle, and high, their teacher, and their parent. And we went to Dave and Buster's for lunch that day. Very and good. the fundraiser, they paid for the lunch and everything. And then the other students that came up like second, third place, we gave them a family of four gift card to go to the movies or go out to dinner. So... Mm-hmm. Let them know of their hard work pay off. Yes. So I wanted to bring that piece in that there is a good inspiring side to the life of an educator. But this just goes to show you, ladies and gentlemen, the roles and the hats and the creativity things we have to do to build those relationships because trust is earned. It's not yes. automatically given. Mm-hmm. So, Miss Dr. Bell, before we get off this amazing conversation, because this is my topic, I can I, I can go on and on about it, but I don't want to hold you. What would be your call to actions for educate for school officials, mm-hmm. legislators, educators, parents, and even students before we get off this amazing series, the day in the life of an educator? Mm-hmm. For us, all of us to increase our expectations. Our expectations, firstly, of one another 
asking ourselves the question daily, am I doing what's best for children? Um, holding one another accountable to the answer to that question, increasing those expectations of our parents and community members, expecting them to be a part of your community and to participate. And lastly, increasing those expectations of our children. I don't wanna hear about how low, I don't wanna hear about learning loss. Yes, it has happened, okay. I don't wanna hear about where they live. Yes, they live in poverty, okay. The question is, what are we going to do while I'm standing in front of them as a teacher, while I'm standing in front of my teachers as a principal, while I'm standing in front of my principals and other central office administrators, what are we gonna do when they're in front of us? So increase our expectations, all of us, one of, another, of one another and of our children, expecting them to reach for the stars because they will if we expect it of them. That would be my call to action. I love that. That is mm -hmm. so, so beautiful. So Dr. Bell, if anyone want to get in touch with you or for speaking engagements for Trent, how can they reach you? How can they connect with you? They can reach me at lorianbell one at gmail.com. That is literally L-O-R-I-A-N-N-B-E-L-L -L -L and the number one at gmail.com. I can be reached that way. That is awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard this amazing series of Learn Life on Courageous Conversation, the day in the life of an educator in polarized political times in the educational system. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Bell has gave us a call to action, but Teresa want to give you one. Please support your teachers in yeah. every way possible. Nothing too small will be um is appreciated if they need supplies if they need lunch uh, that's another thing i used to have some of my parents would bring me lunch when you know volunteer in the classroom sometimes to help them out if they have to go to trainings or just to supervise the classroom or give them a gas card something to say thank you for all the efforts that educators do and the values because they do a lot and many of them are not paid enough for what they do and all. the many hats that they juggle and as Dr. Bell go and do classroom observations let's help our children get more connected and involved in technology because that is way the way learning is leaning that is the way learning is going and if you need help ask your teacher your teacher may have resources or they can connect with their school administrators to help you get connected with what you need. So thank you so much again, Dr. Bell, for this amazing interview. I've learned a lot how public education runs in Michigan, and I hope to have many more conversations with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Ms. Campbell. It's been a great conversation, and I look forward to talking with you again. Awesome. Thank you for listening to Courageous Conversation with Teresa W. Gamble. Bridging generational gaps through active listening and action-oriented changes.